Welcome to Bone to Pick, Hip Bone Music's Artist of the Month interview series. We are here today at the Juilliard School in New York City, and uh, I am absolutely honored to interview one of the greatest trombone players of all time, Mr. Joe Alessi. Um, Joe has been the principal trombonist of the New York Philharmonic for almost 30 years. He's one of the greatest trombone soloists. He's also one of the finest teachers anywhere in the world. Uh, he's done it all for over three decades and done it at the absolute highest level. Um, Joe, thank you so much for taking time out of your extraordinarily busy schedule to uh, spend some time with us today and talking about your amazing career and the great life you've led as a musician. Thanks, and it's a great honor to be uh, to interviewed here with you, and I'm, I would like to interview you, actually, right. at some point. So. <laughs> <laughs> I might take you up on that, but okay. thank you so much, Joe. Uh, I just wanted to start with kind of a, a, a personal story that Joe may not remember this. Um, when I was in high school, I got into the California All-State Symphonic Band one year, and uh, they sent out the uh, list of who you would room with. And uh, to my good fortune, the, the name came, and it was Ralph Alessi, who was Joe's uh, younger brother, a great trumpet player in his own right. And so Ralph and I spent the weekend together playing in the band and hanging out and talking. And uh, I have to confess, most of the talking was me asking Ralph about his older brother, Joe. And Ralph was a great sport about it, but I think by the end of the weekend, he'd pretty much had enough. And, uh, <laughs> and Ralph said, you know, listen, if you want to talk to Joe, why don't you just call him up? And uh, I said, really? Okay. He said, you know, here, here's his number. He's at Curtis Institute in Philly, and uh, he'll talk to you. Don't worry. And so I was like, I get home, and I was kind of nervous, and I, I called up Joe, and uh, left a message, and I thought, oh, he's not going to call me back. And uh, sure enough, Joe called me back uh, a day or two later and couldn't have been more gracious and helpful and insightful and answered all my questions and took the time. And it just, uh, it, it really meant a lot then. And looking back on it, it still means a really uh, a lot. And, and I've been fortunate to work with Joe since then on uh, motion picture work here in New York and television commercials and CD projects. And it's uh, it's always inspiring and always a, a pleasure to work with Joe. So uh, we're looking forward to uh, to talking to Joe today about his amazing career. Um, and you're still you're still asking me questions. That's right. I'm still trying to. Be <laughs> 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 There's so much uh, information there. I'm just going to keep asking. So, uh, um, Joe, you grew up in the Bay Area, um, as did I, and uh, you were already extremely well known and uh, very uh, highly regarded when you were in uh, high school. Um, Maybe you could talk a little bit about that time in your life. Um, you held a position in the San Francisco Ballet Orchestra when you were still a teenager, uh, also soloed with the San Francisco Symphony as a teenager, which are obviously incredible accomplishments. Um, also, if you could talk, um, for those of you who don't know, Joe's dad, Joe, uh, was a great trumpet player and uh, an entrepreneur. He was kind of ahead of his time in many, in many respects. Uh, I'd love to hear your thoughts about the influence that your dad had on you, uh, both as a young man and, and as a young musician. Well. Growing, growing up in the Bay Area, uh, as you know, we had a wealth of uh, great music making. The teachers, uh, you know, we can name tons of great teachers. Uh, and so the, the guidance that we had was just unmatched um, in, in some ways. And it, uh, going, well, working with Ned Meredith and Mark Lawrence and Miles Anderson, I'll name all the names, and Mitchell Ross, and, uh, and plus the, all the other young players like Steve Witzer. And it was just a, a fantastic way to, to work on your playing. And, and, you know, I had a little bit of jazz experience. Of course, I'm a frustrated jazz player, and I'd love, love to take some lessons sometime with you and, <laughs> and uh, pick your brain. But, uh, you know, even the little uh, jazz experience I got out there, I was very lucky. I, my, my high school buddy, uh, Bob Elkier, was a great jazz mm -hmm. trumpet player, and, and he, he's my arranger now. But also, uh, you know, auditioning once for the Monterey Jazz Festival, uh, you know, young, I don't know what they called the, the all-star band they called right, it. Right, sure. But uh, so I, I did you do that in one year? I, I, I did that one year, yeah and, yeah. and I remember seeing your name on it because I remember thinking like, this guy's such a great orchestra player. Now he's in this world too. <laughs> what, what's going on here? Well, that, that to me was just going to that and playing with, you know, great players. And, you know, you just can't get that kind of education anywhere. Mm -hmm. And so mm -hmm. uh, I was very fortunate. And then getting back to my father, Yes, he, he was a, a great teacher. Uh, a lot of, he had a lot of trumpet students. I mean, anytime I go back there, I always run into a student of his. Mm. Um, 
So he, he, his knowledge of, of brass playing was, was great. He showed me how to make a good embouchure, um, which is, I think is, a, unfortunately, there's not a lot of good teachers that really know how to start a beginner. To mm -hmm. Say, well, you know, to make the embouchure, you do this. And, and there's certain things that have to happen, I think, when, as a young player, and if you end up, you know, this is not true for everybody, there's a lot of weird embouchures out there, that's for sure. Mm -hmm. But my father just set me up with, you know, what he considered to be a, a solid foundation. And uh, so I always remember that and thankful, thankful to him for, for that, uh, for doing that. Uh, and then, you know, just listening to all his exercises and all the trumpet students that came through every day, there was at least eight to ten students that would come mm -hmm. in and take a half, half hour lesson. Some of these players were fantastic. So listening to how he would teach and how he would teach rhythm, and he, you know, he, he did not like bad rhythm because mm. I heard you know, he was pretty firm about that, and you know, he, would, he would yell. He says, <laughs> not like this, like this. Ta, 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 like this, because he had to have very strict rhythm from his students. So um, I think that kind of wears off on you. Mm -hmm. and, and, and just from listening to the lessons, even while you're just waking up, you know, like on eight o'clock in the morning, he would start teaching. So uh, you'd be so, kind of half asleep listening to these, these lessons and you're just learning, you know? And, and um, so, and, and, and then as I got older and, and, and I did study with him and that went fine, although the emotional uh, battle that we had, he just sent me to another teacher. It was, I think this is very common. If, if, yeah, if, a, if, a, <laughs> if a son studies with his father, uh, it, you know, they're, they're eventually they're gonna have to move, move on. Yeah, so yeah. he was very smart. He sent me to uh, a teacher, his name is Barry Ehrlich. And, sure, and I know Barry. Yeah. Yes, yeah, well. and, and, yeah. and he, he, uh, he, I asked my father, why did you send me to Barry? He said, well, Barry was a fine player. He had a good embouchure and I, knew, I could tell that he knows what he's doing. And, and so sure enough, uh, Barry had me, you know, he worked on my structure and, and you know, not a lot of moving, keep the embouchure very steady, and, and especially when you tongue. And, and uh, he had me work in a mirror and all these things that I work on with my own students, you know, uh, and he, he insisted on a nice sound, mm -hmm. you know, when you play something. So, uh, and Barry took me through the same books. He started. He, he continued Schlossberg. He continued Arbonne's simple slurs. Uh, nothing. Nothing. Just the basics, mm -hmm. you know. And we worked on rhythm. And anyway, and then Barry said, you know, okay, I, I, that's all I can do with this guy. So uh, then I went on to you know Ned Meredith, who played second trombone in the symphony, and he continued with me. And um, but to this day, I mean, my father is no longer here anymore. I I think. Uh, often of his teaching. And I'll be honest with you, there's, there's every brass player has a bad day or you lose your way a little bit. Uh, the, the trick is to find your way back, mm -hmm. you know? So during those moments when you're, you don't feel exactly right and, and you know, you, you wanna, um, I would call him, you know, call him on the phone from, uh, from New York. And he says, yeah, yeah, do this. And, and sure enough, it's, that's, that's all I needed, you know? Mm -hmm. So just, you know, so I, I, all that advice he, is, he, he had given me all through the years, you know, it's, it's all here and I continue to, uh, you know, to do that. And, and uh, what, what else can I tell you? He, he was just, uh, he was a good guy. And, but, uh, and a lot of people in New York, it's really weird to be in New York where he worked, mm -hmm. you know, and there's, there's still people will come up to me and say, well, I knew your father and I work with him, or, you know, some people know that my grandfather worked here also. Mm. He, he taught at Manhattan School of Music. And, uh, oh, I didn't know that. Yeah, yeah, he, he, his, his couple of his students, uh, Joe Wilder was his student. Oh, is that right? Wow. And Joe Shepley uh -huh. was his student. Um, uh, so anyway, yeah, so it's, 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 it's very strange. You know, I grew up in California, I come back here and, and my mother worked here too. You know, sure, she worked yeah. at the Met. And um, so anyway, uh, there's somebody just gave me a photo of her outside the stage door at the old Met, you know. So 
all this, it's kind of a lot of history here for me. Well, yeah, well. you have some incredible roots here. Yeah. It's amazing. Yeah. You know, it's interesting to hear you say that about, because I've always thought your embouchure was like the perfect model embouchure, and, and to, to hear you talk about your dad, you know, kind of uh, giving you that foundation, that's great. Also, your rhythmic feel. Um, we've done a lot of work together in the studios, and I was always impressed by how you you were able to play so well with the click, which is not always the case with... Uh, oh, I always think I have trouble players. doing that. But well, <laughs> <laughs> didn't never seem like it to me. So. Well, then, well, following high school, you went to uh, the, the prestigious Curtis Institute of Music and studied with uh, the great Glenn Dotson. So uh, maybe you could share some yes. of the memories of that, that time of your life. Well, oh, I forgot to mention Mark Lawrence, you know, mm, who was... Of course. Maybe I, I didn't or I didn't, but if I didn't, I, I want to say he was a, a great teacher and great influence. But he sort of, he went to Curtis and... Mm -hmm. and said, you know, this might be a good place for you to study. Mm -hmm. And so when I, I, I got in there and, and I studied with Dee Stewart uh, initially, and I, I always consider him to be, uh, you know, one of my favorite teachers. Mm -hmm. And and he he got me through a lot of stuff at that time with uh, air and related to air. And I, did, I wasn't really a, a big air thinker. You know, you just take a breath and play. Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> but he's, he really uh, made me think about you know what is needed in the upper register versus the lower register and got me thinking in those terms and then um, then I got to the opportunity to study with Glenn and um, uh, Glenn at that point uh, we just only spoke about musical things very very little technical items Interesting. Um, so he he took me through a lot of etudes uh, more difficult etudes, uh, you know, um, and his way of playing spoke to me uh, because he was sort of a, uh, he didn't play the instrument in a passive way, mm -hmm. you know, he, he, <laughs> he, uh, he, he played it in a very, very active way and I, I, I always, that spoke to me and I, I, in some ways I tried to copy him, you mm -hmm. know, uh, unsuccessfully I think because there's only one Glenn Dotson, but um, but in the act of trying to copy him, it showed me what I needed to work on. And, and, and then, of course, I got to work with him. He, he had confidence in me enough to ask me if I, when Dee left the orchestra, if I would sit next to him in the, in the, to play second to him. And, and that was a dream come true. Mm -hmm. I, I, I really am blessed with, with how everything worked out because, uh, you know, I'm blessed in the way that I got to learn all all the time mm. from somebody, mm -hmm. you know, along the way. Some great player sitting next to me, and then Charlie Vernon came along, and he sat on the other side of me. So it was like, you know, I was, that was I was uh, twenty uh, twenty or one or twenty two years old, listening to these great players, and and that's all you could do was learn. Yeah. So, you know, unfortunately, Glenn's not with us anymore, but yeah. he I miss him a lot. Yeah. yeah. I remember uh, being at Eastman with Steve Witzer, and uh, we uh, when you got the job in Philadelphia, and then and then Charlie came, and there was just like the buzz and the what what a trombone section, Glenn Dotson, Joe Lessie, and Charlie Vernon does, doesn't get much better than that. And uh, um, you, of course, have had great sections here in New York, and you know, your whole career, you've, uh, wherever you've gone, you've been kind of the focal point of it. But uh, that must have been quite a quite a time to be in that section at that age. It was, be and the other thing is uh, Ricardo Muti. Um, gave us the green light mm. many times to when a trombone line came he wanted to hear it he wanted us to play and and everybody was putting out the same kind of sound and and we were we were also our intonation was I think uh, really uh, spectacular yeah. and one of the reasons why I think our intonation was spectacular and we played so well together is because we did the singing thing Mm. Uh, we had a barbershop quartet. Oh, is that right? Yes, and you can see some of this on YouTube. <laughs> so there's a, you wouldn't recognize me at all. <laughs> but, uh, you know, we, the reason why that came about is the fourth trumpet player in the orchestra one day just, you know, he was a, came from a barbershopping family, uh, a couple generations, and he was from the Midwest. And so he says, hey, I got these... Uh, barbershop quartets you know uh, would you like to try these and we were on a bus i think we were in harrisburg uh at penn state we were okay. at penn state and we were 
nothing much to do, and we were sitting on the bus, just bored out of our minds. <laughs> and so at the end of the, when we arrived, he said, you know, let's just try these. Mm -hmm. We're in the back of the bus, and he had these little lead sheets, and Glenn and me and Charlie uh, and, and Roger started humming these things. You know, we didn't want anybody to hear us. And then we sort of said, wow, this is fun. And so we started learning the charts. And we would learn these charts uh, on company time. We would be uh, waiting to play a Brahms symphony or something, and, and they were doing a concerto. And we said, well, what do we do? Well, let's sing. Let's do some singing. So, you know, anyway, l things led to one another. And, which, and we became uh, very popular with the orchestra. We, we had quite a reputation. It was called the Philharmonic Flavor, is the name of the group. Wow. Anyway, we went to, we, the weirdest gig we did was we went to a uh, farm and tractor convention. <laughs> and they wanted some entertainment, and so they, they hired our group. And what made our group interesting is we would play and sing, or sing mm. and play, you know, so, and Roger played the slide trumpet. And so that was a fun time for yeah. me, because... You know, just to say, okay, well, let's play in the orchestra, but let's play in this, let's do this barbershop quartet thing also. You know, so, okay. And because of this, uh, you know, my point was, is we had the, exactly the same intonation. Yeah. It's really something. Well, you've given me some good YouTube viewing for tonight. So as soon as we're done, we'll uh, go check that out. I, yes. bet, I bet it was uh, great. It always struck me with Glenn, especially he came <laughs> when I was at Eastman and gave a master class, and I was bowled away by it. I just thought it was incredible. Um, and I know he was a good Dixieland player, and he was just very, uh, as you as you experienced, much more than all of us who just heard that one master class, but he just, everything he, uh, uh, his entire approach was based on music, it seemed like. And, and that kind of lends itself to if you're going to sing in a barbershop quartet or play Dixieland or play principal trombone in the Philadelphia right. Orchestra. I know he played with, he talked about playing with Pete Fountain and mm. Al Hurt. Mm -hmm. You know, he was in New Orleans at that time. Right. right. And all my teachers were there together. And uh, mm. Ned Meredith played in, with Glenn in the orchestra as well as uh, Dee Stewart. Mm. Wow. So. Um, following your, your four years in the Philadelphia Orchestra, you, you uh, were principal trombone of the Montreal Symphony for, a, I guess, just one year, right? And what was that like going from the section position <coughs> in Philadelphia to, to playing principal in, in Montreal? Well, you know, you got to learn somewhere, and, and uh, everybody has to, people say, well, he doesn't have any experience, uh, you know, whatever. But, you know, people forget, you know, that we all had no experience at one point. So for me to go into that position at that time was, was perfect for me because, uh, you know, I, I the, the orchestras played very differently. Mm -hmm. The brass sections played very differently. And it took me a while to figure out that I'm not in the Philadelphia Orchestra anymore. Mm -hmm. I had to make some adjustments. And, uh, you know, so uh, by, the, by the time I figured out the adjustments, then it was time to leave and play in the New York Philharmonic. <laughs> so, uh, the, you know, but those adjustments mainly were, just, it was, you know, it's a very light kind of orchestra, h homogenous, um, and, and, Charles Dutois, who will be here this coming week, he was my boss there, and and you know to his credit, he he made that a great orchestra. Mm -hmm. I mean, it, it it you know he the way he would he would rehearse the kind of sound that he wanted and everything. So, uh, you know, if I'd stayed there a little bit longer, I would have gotten to record some great repertoire. But mm. uh, you know, the brass section, the great brass players, Jim Thompson was there, mm. and Ellis Ween, and um, so it was, it was a lot of Americans in the brass section. And, and it was very strange, you know, to go to, it took me, um, it took a little bit of courage to leave the Philadelphia Orchestra to go to another country, especially sure. Quebec, where, you know, Quebec is, is almost, they want to be their own country, mm -hmm. actually still, yeah, to this sure. day. So, uh, uh, so speaking a different language and, and et cetera, um, it was a bit intimidating, mm. you know, but, uh, I listened to the recordings. I said, "This is this is fantastic. This orchestra plays great." And they they went on tours and, and international tours, so um, it was uh, you know it was a great great place to be. Mm -hmm.